Okay, welcome to CSE 369, Introduction to Digital Design. My name's Garrick Selig. Um, you can find me in my office uh, at CSE 228, or you can email me at gselig at uw.edu. Um, so email me with questions about or comments about the videos. If you have you know, comments about the lab or um, grading and whatnot, you should contact your TAs. So um, if you want to learn more about digital, di digital design than I can cover in these few um, di uh, video lectures, I recommend that you get the book by uh, Brown and Vanizic. It's called Fundamentals of Digital Logic with Verilog Design. And in the class, I occasionally refer to specific chapters in that book. And I mean I I specifically in the third edition here. Now, as I already sort of pointed out, right, there's a, a whole lot of more information to be found on the lab on the on the website for this class, especially lab hours, um, how the grades are made, um, even the, no the actually the, the PowerPoint notes that go with this video, etc. Good. So I mean, you know, you might ask yourself, why do you want to study digital design? I think the answer to that is really simple because electronics, or digital electronics specifically, are all around us. Right? In computers, car electronics, robots, appliances, cell phones and more. And in this class, really, we kind of learn at the very basic level of how the circuits in these devices look like and how we can build them. Okay, so let me start with a few very basic examples. Um, specifically, we want to make a few, we want to build car electronics. So the first circuit we want to build essentially tells you whether you left the door open or not, right? So you have door ajar, and we're going to assume, in this case, that it, this is a function of these two inputs, driver door open, passenger door open. <coughs> and you could say that the, you know, the circuit that you want to build is something like this. It says, like, door ajar should be on if the driver door is open or passenger door is open. So you might write door ajar equal to driver door open or passenger door open. And you could also represent that diagrammatically by the following circuit. So this here is an OR gate, as you probably know from CSE 311 or some other class. The output of the OR is DA, so driver door, dri uh, door ajar. And the two inputs are DDO and PDO. OK, so at this point, you can pause the video and you know draw the circuit for that next example yourself. Actually, just uh, as, a, as a comment, a lot of this class is quite, or can be quite interactive. There's going to be lots of examples like this, where there's an incomplete slide. And I'll fill in the slides um, as I go. Often, it makes sense for you to pause at that point, the video at that point, and kind of solve the problem yourself, and then check whether you have the same solution as I do. I think that will be very helpful in kind of practicing the concepts that I'm introducing. I'll try to point out when to wh when it would be a good opportunity to pause, or maybe, um, but you can al often you might also just see it, um, see for yourself. Good. So in the second example, right? So we have high beam indicator, which is a function of lights and high beam selected. And of course, in this case, you would say that the high beam indicator should be on if the lights are on and the high beam is selected. So you might write HBI is equal to lights and HBS. And again, the graphical notation for that would be an AND gate. Notice here the flat back compared to the OR where the output is HBI, high beam indicator, is either true or false, or on or off, and your inputs are lights and high beam selected. Good. So a third example here, the seatbelt light should be on if the driver belt is not in. So S B L equal to not 
driver belt in and the corresponding graph looks something like this. This is a NOT gate, the triangle with the dot here. Your output is SPL and your input is DBI. I mean the NOT gate also referred to as an inverter, of course. <coughs> and then in this final example, you know, we can put some of these concepts together to get essentially a, a control circuit that that's a little bit more complicated than the three uh, very simple examples we've seen. So we have seatbelt light again, and this time it's a function of the driver belt being in or not, passenger belt in, passenger present. <coughs> so in this particular case, you might say that the seatbelt light, so SPL, is on, where one situation it'd be on is if the driver belt is not in, as we've already seen, so not driver belt in, or in another case, if there's a passenger and the passenger is not wearing the seatbelt, right? So it's not DBI or passenger present and not passenger belt in. And of course the corresponding circuit diagram looks something like this here. So I have my inputs, DBI, driver belt in, and NOT gate, passenger belt in, passenger present, Let me erase this for a second. So again, we have a NOT gate here. These two get anded together. And then we have the OR gate here. And that's our output. OK. Good. So far, so easy. Just to summarize, I've essentially introduced these three basic gates. The AND gate, where the output is true if A and B are true. The OR gate, where the output is true if A or B is true, or if both are true. And then the inverter, or NOT gate, where A is false. If A is false, then the output is true. You know, having seen these extremely basic examples of, of sort of circuits that we can design, um, let me make a couple high-level comments. So the first one is sort of this distinction between digital and analog, right? So in digital circuit design or in digital circuits, we assume that we are working with discrete values, so bo binary or Boolean values, um, yes, on, high voltage, true, one, no is sort of one type of value, the positive value, no of low voltages, false, zero, um, is the opposite value. <coughs> in contrast, in like analog circuits, you essentially can have any intermediate value, values in addition to sort of the, the you know, high and low voltages. And we're not going to talk about analog circuitry in this class at all. Why are digital circuits you know, popular compared to analog circuits? I think the fundamental reason is that in analog systems, slight errors in an input can result in very large errors in an output. Um, digital systems, in, in contrast, are accurate and more, and more reliable. And they essentially have this sort of built-in property of signal restoration. Right? If, you're in a signal, if you work in a digital context and you know that your signals are you know, 0 volt or 5 volts, if you actually have a signal that's you know, 4.8 volt, you understand that this should be 5 volts and you can essentially restore it. Or similarly, if you have a signal that's maybe 0.2 volts, you know that that's an error and you can sort of suppress that error. In an analog system, in contrast, since 0.2 or 4.8 both have a meaning, you can't really just go in and change those value to what they should be, even if they are errors. You just can't know. 
And so it's very easy for errors to, to sort of accumulate in analog systems, while in digital systems this would not happen. Um, of course, digitals, because of this you know, robustness property, computers use digital circuits internally. But on the other hand, it's, it's, you know, the real world is analog. And so of course, interface circuits, sensors, etc., or actuators are often analog. Okay, and that's something we'll so this is something you have to take into account in the design. Another high-level concept that I want to want to introduce is this distinction between a combinational and a sequential circuit. So let me start at the bottom of the slide actually, talking about combinational circuits. So in a combinational circuit, you essentially have inputs and outputs, and there's no feedback from the outputs to the inputs. A sequential circuit is a bit more complicated. It essentially consists, starts with a combinational circuit, but you're also allowed to kind of add feedback path. And this feedback really results in very different types of behavior that, that are possible. And so in this class, we'll talk both about combinational and sequential logic, and we'll start with essentially simpler combinational logic.